everyone. My name is Kat Savage and I'm a professional artist, clinical hypnotherapist and well-being expert working with those in the creative arts sector. In my line of work, I get to meet some amazing, colourful people from actors to artists, people who live their lives by their own rules, fueled by passion and determination to bring their unique talents into the world. I wanted to discover what it took for people to leave the usual nine to five and hop on a dream, to capture their bravest moments and share these meaningful conversations with you so that together we can explore the ideas, emotions and moments that could potentially change our lives too. So let's keep talking, have some fun and enjoy the show. This week on the Brave Moment podcast, we continue our conversation in part two of Steph Hill's incredible story of success, psychology and surviving the 2004 tsunami. We discover what motivated and inspired her to create her business, Happy Headwork, the steps she took to manifest her dreams for herself and her son, and her advice for how we can all achieve better mental health and create our own goals for success. If you haven't already listened to part one of this podcast, please press pause and return to your favourite streaming site and listen. The link to part one can be found in the show notes of this episode. I'm so excited to speak to you again. I've been thinking about your podcast ever since we recorded it. And it's, uh, yeah, it's exciting me to know what happens next in your life. So the first question that I'd like to know is what, what's been your proudest moment in your career? Proudest moment in my career. Do you know the one that really springs to mind is it's, I was in Cambodia. I had gone to deliver some training on this um, ongoing project that I'm working with the United Nations Office of Drugs and Crime on. Um, and it's around developing the capacity of law enforcement officers around the, uh, in Asia, in, around the ASEAN uh, region, um, to become more gender responsive in their approach to trafficking crimes. Wow. And, um, uh, very long story short, I developed the training curriculum and um, for this particular workshop. At the start of the workshop, I was asking the officers, you know, what they thought. And I was showing them pictures of um, women working at sex working. I was asking them, how do you think that woman felt and so forth? And we were kind of exploring mm. this. And it was met with quite a lot of prejudice, to be honest with you. It was very much kind of victim blaming as well um, when we were exploring it from the angle of trafficking. Mm. And, and it's one of my underlying objectives from these workshops was to encourage law enforcement officers to feel empathy with victims because you know you can teach people all about process but when they go back to their own jobs they're going to have to work within the processes they already have up. Sure. So if you can catalyse empathy in someone then it creates a motivation to, to, to find their own way through change. Mm. And so I got all of the law enforcement officers to do this um, activity, which I designed, which was basically a guided visualisation. And when I, I got them all to sit in these chairs around the room and I could see the, the project management team from the UN twitching, thinking, what on earth is she getting these people to do? Because <laughs> they were kind of used to everything being done through PowerPoint and all that kind of stuff, yeah, whereas yeah, I yeah. got them all up. And So I guess I, I, I led them through this visualisation and I was exploring the shift in emotions and all sorts. The objective of the activity was to get them to visualise um, a positive experience from their past and it was to model to them how when we relive things it can cause this literal physical shift inside us, emotional shift. Mm. And then from there we were going on to explore how when they're interviewing victims of trafficking you know, how getting them to relive trauma will cause a negative shift from them. And it was kind of exploring psychology, really. Mm. So in any case, I got them to all do this. And at the end of the activity, I got feedback from the participants. And there'd been this kind of very quiet, um, older man, um, you know, quite high ranking in the in the workshop that week. And he'd sat there kind of very stern most of the week. But after I said, oh, does anyone volunteer? I noticed him kind of like trepidly putting his hands, uh, putting on his hands hand up and saying um yeah I will so through an interpreter I was wearing a earpiece he spoke mm. on a microphone to the whole room and he said you know what there are many many things I could have drawn on in terms of good experiences but nothing will ever 
um, replace the feeling that I found in the in the seventies um, as a child, because. Um, we had lived under the Khmer Rouge regime all of my childhood. We couldn't yeah. play, we couldn't have fun, we couldn't meet with family. You know, it was just hell. And then the day that the the Khmer fell, um, I remember that day so vividly. For the first time, I knew what joy was, what freedom was. And he explained it. And do you know what? I still have goosebumps all over my body, cat. And oh. um, the whole room was just captivated by what he was saying some of them had lived like that themselves some of them were younger and, and didn't know it um but actually I had this room full of law enforcement officers and they were crying like they lots of people in the room had tears coming down their face and mm. so I stood there with the microphone with tears spilling down my face too and I just let them fall um and it it, uh, it wasn't a traumatizing space it was a a beautiful space yeah. um, and and I thanked him so much for saying that and I said you know you can clearly see I'm emotional and I'm not going to ever apologise for feeling that emotion mm -hmm. I will remember this all my life and um, and in any case shortly after we, we did that uh, we, we finished off the session and it was the last session of the whole workshop and um, I said to everyone what did you take from this session everyone had to give feedback and one guy stood up and said something and then another guy stood up and said you know what I'm taking something which I didn't think I would take from this workshop I'm taking empathy oh. before I came, he said when I started this week I hadn't thought about what it feels like for victims um, and that sometimes victims themselves are forced into criminal activity and we view them as criminals as well yeah. um, but this week has made me really think about how it feels for them and I said oh can everyone anyone that every time someone was saying what they'd brought back from the workshop I'd say well, stand up if you felt that too and different people would stand up so I said that and one by one the whole room oh stood up oh my goodness <laughs> now I've got goosebumps all over my body that was the proudest moment of my career to date and it may always be the proudest moment of my career to date uh, as well yeah <laughs> I, I just I'm so touched by that and and especially in in jobs where sometimes we do dehumanize people that they're more almost yeah. animals in some respects and you know it makes me think about the things that we see on the news today and and you know even uh I, I was listening to news and listening to the the stuff that's oh, going on in Myanmar yeah. at the moment and just couldn't even comprehend why mm. it was even happening. I, I just can't imagine viewing yeah. another person as anything other than human. So to have that empathy reinstalled in in mm. into them in that moment, oh, mm. I, I can't imagine what that must have felt like for you. It Steph. was, and for, so for every reason that you're just saying as well. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. If you can catalyze empathy in someone, or you can encourage them to feel it feel empathy to a greater level then what you do is that you spark their drive to do more you spark their drive to learn more and approach things from a different angle which ultimately hopefully will then benefit the people that really need need it the most vulnerable populations in our society what a massive achievement to come from where you were you know not that long before to where you are now is it's just absolute testament to your strength of will, your focus and how you can be driven by, you know, the events in your life in a positive way. So mm. what do you cherish in your life now that you may have taken for granted if if you hadn't been through what you've been through? <laughs> That's a lovely question, actually. And do you know what? The simple answer to that is just being here, Kat. Mm. Actually just being here. When I think of that, I think, you know, one of the things that pops into my mind is that us as British people, we often complain about the weather. It's something that we do in our, in our society. <laughs> and I... I kind of made a pledge to myself a long time ago not to complain about the weather. Um, you know, I can be freezing cold outside or being beaten by the rain and the wind. And inside I'm saying to myself, do you know what? The fact you're actually feeling that means you're still here. And how wonderful is that? Oh, that's just <laughs> Burst my heart right open to hear that. What an incredible statement to, to life itself, let alone in your own emotional place in your heart. Um, how do you feel that you've grown emotionally from, from all of this? And what do you consider your strengths now as a result? Um, the resilience, mm. the knowledge that I've been to some really, really dark places that where I felt literally painfully uncomfortable to just be in my own skin mm. and now 
I just, I feel comfortable to the point where I can stand in front of a room of 80 law enforcement officers um, <laughs> training for the United Nations through an interpreter. <laughs> and, and I, and I feel comfortable, but not in a kind of way that when I was younger, you kind of fake it till you make it kind of way. I literally feel like I can just be me. Um, mm. I can be perfectly imperfect. I feel this genuine sense of, confidence not often a kind of manufactured confidence just this comfortable confidence in who I am and I cannot tell you how lovely that feels knowing where it's come where it's come from you know comparing it to where I was Mm. I am so grateful to feel that I'm I'm just thinking about all the listeners at the moment listening to this thinking oh my goodness you know I really I wish I could feel that that way about myself and and so I really want to know like what advice would you give to especially to other women in particular who need that encouragement to go ahead and manifest their own dreams what advice would you give them a about doing that and b about finding that that confidence in themselves Mm. the first thing I would say is allow yourself the luxury to dream Mm. that is so important don't start by looking at obstacles or having an idea and then looking at all the millions of ways it can't possibly work. Mm. Literally allow yourself to dream. When I first started the business, I was skint. I I left my career um, in London and I literally got a big pin board and I put on it some goals to have to have this business to work X amount of days per year to earn this much money to who my clients were going to be um, to the things I wanted to um, have like to be able to buy a house for me and my son and allowed myself to dream allowed Mm. myself to believe in myself the second thing is don't allow what other people think of your dreams to impact on how you feel about them there will always be people even the most well-intentioned lovely people in your life who kind of you know think they're trying to protect you by sort of encouraging you not to try something or or looking at you (laughs) as if that's a bit crazy why are you doing that (laughs) don't do that don't listen to it (laughs) follow your heart people (laughs) it's so true you know um because they'll eventually come around to your way of thinking um and uh, (laughs) And you'll be like see I told you so I told you I can do it you You should have heard my mum's reaction when I told her I was buying a boat and then she was (laughs) then she was the biggest advocate of the boat she loved it and the third bit of advice is don't worry about doing a five-year plan okay don't worry about that stuff there's a great Martin Luther King quote I think it is you don't need to see the full staircase just take the first step Mm. and I love that because often when we think about business planning and so forth or whatever whatever your dream is um we think about all right got to plan this got to look for this got to do it you know risk manage just start taking small steps because otherwise if you get bogged down in too much of the detail sometimes it can crush your dreams before you before you even start Mm, that's a wonderful, wonderful advice, and and I'm doing a little fist pump in the air. It's just saying, <laughs> like, yeah. I'm a, I'm at the moment. I'm reading a, a wonderful book by Stephen Pressfield called The War of Art, which is all about imposter yeah. syndrome and and creativity and things like that. And and he basically says like the same sort of sentiment, and and just hearing it on repeat really does help you to believe that it's possible to do what you want to do with your life and it totally yes, is you know this whole totally. life is just a massive playground anyway it's it all is. an illusion you know what we create for ourselves mentally it's all up to us really what gets put out into the world at the end of it so I'm listening to that and my heart is just Brilliant. beating in time thinking yes that's delicious Steph thank you <laughs> I'm making a I'm making a note of reading this book now as well so. <laughs> <laughs> I'll send you a link love lovely um, If you could meet your 100-year-old self, what advice do you think she would give you about going forward from this point? (laughs) I think she would say, step up on the yoga and easy on the Friday night we all hello. (laughs) 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 This body's going to last you another 60 years. (laughs) You nearly destroyed it once. Come on, girl. meet you a hundred year old self she sounds like a scream <laughs> if you in reverse of that if you could go back in time and talk to your younger self what would you tell her about your life now and what advice would you give her about what was to come I would probably just give her a really big 
hug, a really big hug. And I would look her in the eyes and I would probably just say, hold your nerve, kid. <laughs> oh, actually, I wouldn't. I wouldn't really want to give her too much advice because she she had to work all that stuff out herself and feel it and experience it because Mm. otherwise it would be denying the now stuff, feeling all the things that I get to feel now. Oh, I'm snapping my fingers (laughs) and tossing my hair. (laughs) We've talked a lot about different brave things that have happened into your in your life, and I know that a lot of people out there will be thinking, "Well, you know, that's a mic drop." But you know, what else could you consider to be a brave moment from from what you've been through? But looking back on it all now, what do you consider one of your emotionally brave moments, other than the ones that we've discussed? And and how did that change you? And and how have you evolved from that? And what values do you hold now as a result? So for me, the bravest moments in my life were in the darkest moments. They were the moments when, you know, even being in a meeting and work was terrifying. I would get this sudden sensation to just want to escape. Or even being around family and friends were was somehow terrifying to me sometimes because I would be fearful that they would, I don't know, think that I was odd or see something in me um, that I was feeling. And um and so just doing the simple things like yeah, being around people um, took a lot of courage um, mm. and they were my bravest moments. And I think that other people living with mental health may, may relate to that as well, because I think when we talk about brave moments, courage is about stepping outside of your comfort zone, right? And I always think mm. of the comfort zone as almost like three circles. You have your comfort zone in the middle, then your learning zone, which is where you go with a little intrepidation, but you learn things. Mm-hmm. And then you have your danger zone um, on the outside. <laughs> and when I was suffering from PTSD, my comfort zone was tiny. My learning zone then was a little bit bigger, but my danger zone was huge. Most of the world was my danger zone. And mm. as I recovered from my emotional and mental health issues, my comfort zone grew and grew. And so my learning zone and my danger zone got smaller and smaller. And so making those kind of other activities that I did, such as, you know, uh, traveling to other countries or training in front of huge groups of people, no longer, Mm -hmm. they they were in my learning zone, they were in my danger zone, they were quite comfortable for me to do. Um, If that makes sense, you know, so yeah, in a nutshell, the bravest moments are those small steps when the whole world felt like a scary place. That's an amazing analogy of like having those three sort of circles of almost trusting yourself. But how did you get to those moments? Like, how did you get up? How did you get yourself to go out of the house? What did you have to do in order to create that new sense of comfort zone? I think it's a title to quite a famous book, um, Feel the Fear and Do It Anyway. I never actually read that book, <laughs> but I actually remember just reading the title of it and getting getting quite a lot from reading that title. Um But just knowing that the fear and the anxiety wasn't necessarily going to go away. But what I could do Mm. was just observe it and and sort Mm. of look at it from a kind of a mindfulness point of view, I guess, where you sort of just observing that fear, but allowing yourself to just keep moving forward one step at a time. And the more that I did that, the more that I... The, the fear would sort of decrease and that my comfort zone would grow, you know? So, um, yeah, just taking those tiny steps and not thinking that I had to wait for the fear to go away before I could do them, but just pushing myself a little bit more and a little bit more to do it. Gently just observing that it was an uncomfortable place, but just going through the motions in any case until it no longer felt uncomfortable. I mean, on this show, we we do cover so many different varieties of what people consider to be something brave. And to hear that some of your bravest moments, despite all of the stuff that you've been through, have just been getting up and getting out of the door. That's going to speak to so many people on so many levels. And it really is a genuine, heartfelt bravery, isn't it? When you're in those moments, just to be able to to get up and, and go and do Yes, definitely. What do you hope to manifest for yourself next? What's going to be on your next pin board? What I'd like to keep on manifesting is just to be able to just keep growing this greedy parallel journey in my career (laughs) to keep on doing, you know, for my work life to keep on looking the way it is, but growing it more. Um, Mm. 
I can't give up either of them. I feel so passionate about either <laughs> of both of them. But with the with the emotional resilience um, side of my work, I'm really very passionate about being able to work with um, survivors of domestic abuse. It's mm. um, an area very close to my heart. Watch that space, basically. There's um, <laughs> some hopefully some news coming there soon. <laughs> I I'm just hearing it, and I'm I'm hearing the passion that you have for your job in your voice, and I I just want to know what drives you to keep going. What what is that thing that every day you wake up and you think, you know what, I'm not going to give up today because this and and that feeling enters your body. Uh, the motivation from the early days of my kind of this journey that we've spoken about today was a lot to do with kind of survivors guilt and this almost feeling of responsibility that I had a second chance, whereas mm-hmm. others didn't. But then over the years, I've allowed allowed myself to to move away from that because it's 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 quite a sort of um it, it's not a comfortable place to, to sit you know mm. um and it's changed to a place of where I recognize that the mind is actually motivated by pleasure um, <laughs> and, and I love what I do I love mm. it I get so much joy and meaning from it um and so there's that alongside the my biggest motivation which is my son and oh. and creating this life and this world for him and and hopefully um do work that when he's older and he can understand it more I hope he's proud of what I do oh my god Goodness, I I can't imagine him feeling any other way. I mean, by that point, you'll have your OBE, your MBE, and all of that kind of stuff, and your book will be out. So you know. <laughs> so we we're coming to the end of this interview, and I'm so so gutted because I could literally talk to you for days. Um, but if anyone out there is thinking about starting their own business or, or going self-employed and, and, you know, toying with that decision in their head and maybe they don't have a dad to say, you know, hold your nerve, kid, what top tips would you give them? And what have you learned about yourself in the process of handling your own business? Just start creating, start somewhere. Whatever that first step is, whether it's for me, it was sitting down and creating a really awfully constructed website um, because I built <laughs> because I built it myself, the first one. But it was because by having that website, I could visualise that I had a business now, you know. Mm. Um, and then by reaching out to the first contacts and saying, "Hey, I'm doing this now," and and starting to look and slowly and slowly just kind of just chipping away at it, you know, not needing to have this massive map of how you were going to get from A to Z no just knowing the first few steps and starting to do that and then kind of letting it proliferate from there really and um you know obviously I plan obviously I plan and I'm and I'm organized most of the time um (laughs) (laughs) um, but um yeah but then not over planning I would say How has that vision board worked out for you? Can you look back on it now and think, yeah, "Yeah, that's worked? (laughs) Like, what's the deal with that? Yeah, so so my first vision board had on it a picture of a camper van because I wanted to buy a camper van for me and my son, a picture (laughs) of a three-bedroom house because I wanted to buy us a home and very explicitly sort of what I wanted my business to be. And I I wanted to work for the United Nations as a consultant, which seems (laughs) seems very ego-driven now looking back. (laughs) (laughs) Worked though, didn't it? (laughs) And and the, um, the other one was that I wanted to go back to Thailand and make peace in my head with Thailand a few years into it and I bought us our first house mm-hmm. I had a camper van which was exactly the same as the one that was on the picture and I was working for the United Nations all across um, Southeast Asia and I think the pinnacle of it was that I got to fly my mum and my son over to Thailand when I was working there and I got to meet my doctor, the doctor at, the, the the surgeon who stitched me back together and sang all those songs with me. I got to go and introduce my son to him and introduce my son to my hero. <laughs> oh my God. My, I'm yeah. welling up again, Steph, just hearing <laughs> that happen. Yeah. How do you feel when you look back on that vision board now? Because, you know, some people listening to this might think, oh, you know, that's a really silly idea. Or they might t- mm. like sort of poo-poo the idea of creating a vision board. But how did that keep you focused? What did you do every day that you saw it? Like what was going through your mind to to keep you on track for that dream? Oh, I swear by taking this approach, actually, um, because... 
when you I, I've used it for lots of different things lots of different things and um when you every day when I sort of look at a vision my vision boards um when I have them it's kind of it helps you to sort of visualise where you want to go. And it's now recognised in neuroscience how powerful visualisation is. Visualisation does a number of things. One of the things is that it creates this reality in our head. Um, our brain doesn't know the difference between real or imagined events. And so if we program it with these powerful, positive, imagined events, then it gives us this kind of muscle memory, for want of a better word. <laughs> um, but it also creates this drive inside us because we're telling our brain that that's the reality that that we want. Mm. And our brain then seeks to help us to, to achieve it because it's always trying to find order, right, in, uh, in, in our world. So there's that. And also we have this amazing thing called the reticular activating system and so Ooh, say it again. <laughs> <laughs> which is basically the gateway to our subconscious and and if we're programming our subconscious with this kind of this reality that we want then our reticular activating system has this amazing way of helping us and um, sort of spot opportunities to give you just a little example of that um I don't know when have you ever wanted a, a new car or or a new fridge right and okay I'm gonna I'm gonna tell you something that's really weird that you've just asked that question yeah. yesterday I I was I parked outside the hairdressers to pick up my mum's shampoo yeah. <laughs> and some car uh, no it was a white van this white van went past my car and crashed into the front of my oh. car and as we're doing this interview my insurance company have just contacted me to tell me about the claim and we're going to have to get a new car so oh yes my gosh. yes I want a new car Steph so tell me how I get one please <laughs> I love it I love it I'm sorry to hear about the crash though gosh sorry I was just I got know. caught up in the serendipity are you okay are you I was I was I was in the hairdresser oh, collecting my mum's shampoo but yeah they hit it whilst it was oh parked. Oh my but gosh. Yeah. So yeah, I'm, I'm in the market for a new car. I'd like to upgrade if it's possible. And I'd also like to get a claim amount that's bigger than I anticipate, please. <laughs> Visualise, cat. <laughs> okay, so, I'm doing so it. So when we, if, if, say for example, you wanted a new car and, and you, you wanted a particular model, for example, and you start thinking about that without even realising. So we visualise without even consciously doing a vision board, for example. We just naturally daydream. Mm. You'll start thinking how that car would feel, picture yourself driving around in it. And all of a sudden, you will notice that model car everywhere. You know, when I <laughs> was pregnant in London, I noticed pregnant women in London everywhere. And I thought, wow, half of London is pregnant. And they, of course, weren't. <laughs> um, but because that was important to me, my retirement, activating system was allowing me to notice those other pregnant women everywhere so that's how it works so back to the vision board if we're programming sort of what we want then our reticular activating system will help us to to, 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 to you know to, to spot opportunities and things that are relevant to us that's unbelievable. Right, listeners, you've heard it here first. Get those vision boards out and also send us some pictures of them because I'd like to see that, please. Right, before I start crying again, I'm going to throw you into a quick fire question round Lovely. to end this interview on a massive high because I think you've taken us all on a massive journey today and uh, and thankfully so. I think your story is so inspiring and I, I know that everyone that's listening to this today will just be just so utterly inspired. They'll all quit their jobs and start their self employed businesses and be <laughs> awesome all right are you ready girl i'm ready <laughs> oh. song you absolutely must sing along to in the car fleetwood mac the chain every morning on the way to school that's what me and my son sing along to <laughs> <laughs> you're too cool for school girl too cool um a smell that reminds you of home barbecues <laughs> a book that made a big impression on you and why Oh, Eckhart Tolle, you know, a new earth. There can be only one. <laughs> we'll put that in the uh, the Brave Moment bookshop as well so people can download it. Yes. Please do, yeah. Favourite film? Goonies. Oh, nice! <laughs> Sloth Love Chunk! Baby Rule! <laughs> And younger listeners, if you haven't seen that film, just go and get it right now and Definitely. treat yourself to some 80s <laughs> wonderment. Um, thing you love most about yourself? Without a doubt, being spontaneous because it's so much fun being me sometimes because of that reason. <laughs> I think I, I can 
definitely relate to that. Sorry, Tim. <laughs> Sorry. Um, biggest accomplishment, either emotionally, physically or spiritually? Without a doubt, being a single mama. Never, ever underplay the power of a single mama. <laughs> Shout out to all our single mamas out there right now. Strong enough to bear the children and get back to business. Um, <laughs> if you're buying me a drink, you'd better buy dot, 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 dot. A fine bottle of Rioja, please. <laughs> oh, oh, lavish. Um, pet peeve. Oh, filters. People using filters all the time. Don't get me wrong, it's fine now and again. But I just I just love it when people don't use them and you can just see the beautiful wrinkles and just all our imperfections I love. Yeah. <laughs> the, the one that gets me the most is the one where people make their eyes bigger. That freaks me out. Oh, just everyone, just don't use that filter, please. It's weird. Um, yeah. Talking of weird, weird thing that you do. Um, do you know what? I, I, so I was born without rhythm and Chris, my late, my, <laughs> Chris, my late partner, was a drummer and I used to drive him nuts, um, my lack of rhythm. So um, I, he taught me how to do this particular beat on the drum and weirdly, whenever I think, like say I've got to concentrate to this day I still tap that on my leg it's weird is it paradiddle is it paradiddle paradiddle dum, 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 dum. oh nice <laughs> <laughs> Tim you'll appreciate that my husband's a drummer by the way oh. um, <laughs> you'd be like yes yeah, she's actually got rhythm now <laughs> um, human trait you love the most authentic kindness you know kind oh. Kindness without agenda, just kindness for kindness sake. Oh, absolutely. And, and I love to see that because I think that if we can, you know, authentic kindness, if we can really practice that with each other, but also if we can practice it with ourselves and if we can practice oh. it with ourselves, then we become better at practicing it with each other also. That. And, you know, a little plug for your happy head work as well. You know, you do teach this on your course, right? <laughs> Certainly do. <laughs> human trait you wish you could change ignorance and hate yeah, yeah without a doubt what makes you sad um I mean lots of things make me feel sad in the world at the moment but um something really close to my heart is the work that I do around trafficking and um and smuggling and when I see the divisive language used by certain political parties and the media around around um, asylum seekers, around irregular migrants who are making a journey, and they are making a journey because where they are coming from was a worse situation, a, a situation bad enough to force them into such a dangerous and perilous journey. Mm. Um, and then, you know, the response of some people is just one of of ignorance and hate and it's just it breaks my heart it really breaks my heart my heart and makes me very angry actually what makes you happy oh so many things so many things <laughs> but if I, was, if I was if I was if I was to choose one thing it would definitely be my little boy just ah. every, just my little boy just seeing when he achieves something that makes himself proud or or when he's like <laughs> laughing his head off or when I see little like wicked traits in him that remind me of me oh it just fills my heart with joy I love it <laughs> what has been the best piece of advice you've ever received Right, this is definitely, um, you can do whatever you want to do if you put your mind to it. So basically, that was the mantra in my family growing up. My mum and dad literally drummed it into me and my brother um, that like whatever we wanted to do in this world, we could do if we put our mind to it. And do you know what? That belief, is I can't express how important it is to encourage our kids to believe in that. Not just by saying the words, but like, by like feeling it and really believing in each other ourselves as well like I knew that my parents meant it when they said it yeah you gotta raise people up people <laughs> that's true and finally what do you think the closest thing to magic is in real life well for me life is the real magic and the oh, stuff good the, kind answer. Of, <laughs> the stuff that we see about magic in stories or films that's just a metaphor for all the magic that we already have in real life you know from from like the simplest thing like looking at the shadows on leaves as like sunlight comes through them or like those lovely like dandelion seeds that float around in the air or you know the, the way that we interact as humans and there is such a thing such as human um, emotional contagion when we literally pick up on each other's emotions you know I mean there is just countless countless things which just proves that life life itself is the real magic 
that's a mic drop moment. Thank you so much. Steph, I'm going to give you your solitary clap for getting through your quick fire question round. <laughs> Thank <Hey>! you. <laughs> so I've got one final question for you just before you let us know a little bit about your courses and where people can mm-hmm. find you. What advice would you like to give to the world right now coming out of this pandemic and we're all sort of like poking our head above the sand going, what on earth is going on? So the first thing I'd like to say is that you are not alone. And when you are suffering from emotional or mental health issues, it can be such a lonely place. Even if you are surrounded by great friends and family, as I was, it can still be an extraordinarily uh, lonely place. And... One of the powerful things uh, that I took, I actually took it from um, the work of Kristen Neuf, who um, uh, who's a professor in, in the University of Texas and does a lot of um, work around self-compassion. And through her work, she encourages people to remember that um, actually, you know, we're all interconnected and somewhere else, someone else in the world will also be feeling similar emotions. And that simple mm. sort of mind to, to yourself that you're not alone um, can be such a powerful thing. Um, Remembering that, you know, emotional and mental health is part of this human condition as well that we have to work through sometimes. The second point I would say is this really doesn't have to be your forever story, okay? Um, when you're when you're in, you know, when I was in the midst of PTSD, I had no idea how I would ever feel differently from it. It can feel so terrifying to think that you have to live the rest of your life feeling like that. But just keep focused on the fact that things can change for you. They really can. Mm. And just keep that optimism. Don't worry about not being able to see how they'll change, but just keep faith that they will change. And sort of picture, remember when I talk about visualisation all the time, picture how you would like to feel. Picture how, how, what your life would like, you'd like your life to look like. Keep your eyes on that. And then the third part is around sort of seek support, of course, seek support from the places that work from you, whether that's from your friends and family, from trained counsellors, from your GP, whatever works for you, that's what works for you. And you're the, ex- you're the <laughs> expert of you. We're all the expert of ourselves. But never underestimate your power in this journey You know, don't put the power, all of the power into the hands of other sort of health professionals to help you. Do that, of course, but also recognise the power that you have. And just, Mm. you know, I'm not suggesting that everyone has to go on these kind of big psychology learning journeys that I went on. You know, I know that's not for (laughs) everyone, but there are a few simple little things that can help everyone. Um, And so if I was to sort of have to pick two things um, to encourage people to go and learn about, one of them would be to go and learn about what unhelpful thinking patterns are. So in psychology, they're called cognitive distortions um, or unhelpful thinking patterns. And there are 15 main ones, such as catastrophizing, mental filtering. And when you read through them you know you it, it's like a moment of oh wow I'm not the only person that thinks these thoughts <laughs> um you know it, they were one of the most life-changing things I ever learned about so go and learn about what the 15 most common and helpful thinking patterns are and then the second thing I would really recommend is that People learn how to practice mindfulness in the everyday. Now, I know mindfulness is really popular now, and but for some people, it's a huge barrier because they think of it as being this, like, you know, 15 minutes meditation type thing. Great if you can meditate. But actually, do you know what? The most powerful thing that I found was actually just practicing little bits of mindfulness throughout the day. So since the middle of suffering from PTSD, since the depths of it, I started every time I wash my hands, which is a lot during the last year, right? Every time I wash my hands, <laughs> um, for that moment, rather than thinking about what I'm going to do next or what I've done before, I literally just focus on the feeling of water on my hands. Mm. And just doing that regularly throughout the day helps you to build this, these kind of really positive um, neural pathways in your brain, really helps to sort of take you out of the anxious brain back into the intellectual brain. And the more we do that, the better we get at doing it and the better we get at being able to process our emotions. Steph, that is such wonderful 
fruitful advice. My favourite part was, you are the expert in you and that's going to stick with yeah. me forever. And, uh, you know, talking about the moment, you mentioned Eckhart Tolle mm-hmm. earlier in the um, in the interview, The Power of Now is another fantastic book Amazing. by him, isn't it? And and sort of is, is harking back to what you were just saying there about being in the moment and just trying to, to really be with yourself in that space of time as opposed to moving forward or back. I, I absolutely love that, Steph. That's wonderful advice. Thank you so, so much. Brilliant. Thank you. Where can people find you? Where can they find your courses? And if there are any businesses out there that want to get in touch, what do they have to do in order to do so? So you can find us at um, www happyheadwork.com brilliant that's so awesome and I will be checking that out and stalking you a little bit from this point on brilliant (laughs) Brilliant. thank you so much Steph I hope you have a wonderful rest of the day thank you so much because I I can honestly not imagine anyone who I would have rather shared my story with so thank you so much (laughs) oh god I'm gonna cry again (laughs) crikey This interview has mentally and spiritually changed me, as I'm sure it has for you, my dear listeners. Steph's courage, her profoundly positive attitude, her focus and drive to create her dream life, all that she is and has become is the very definition of bravery in action. She has literally been at death's door, told herself that it wasn't her time, and came back to show us that life beautiful, incredible life is worth living. That if we can be aware of each moment we are given, if we can find it in ourselves to be present with the life we have been given, we have an opportunity to understand the true definition of what it means to be alive. She offers us some crucial advice. Firstly, that we can observe our thoughts and in doing so have an opportunity to gain some control over them. Here are a few examples of the most common thinking traps. Overgeneralization. Thinking that a negative situation is part of a constant cycle of bad things that happen. People who overgeneralize often use words like always or never. An example? I wanted to go to the beach, but now it's raining. This always happens to me. I never get to do fun things. Black and white thinking. Seeing things is only right or wrong, good or bad, perfect or terrible. People who think in black and white terms see a small mistake as a total failure. An example, I wanted to eat healthier, but I just had a piece of cake. This plan is a total failure. Labeling. Saying only negative things about yourself or other people. Example, I made a mistake at work. I'm stupid. Or, my boss told me that I made a mistake. My boss is a total jerk. Mind reading. Jumping to conclusions about what others are thinking without any evidence. Example. My friend didn't stop to say hello. She must not like me very much. Fortune telling. Predicting that something bad will happen without any evidence. Example. I've been studying hard, but I know that I'm going to fail my test tomorrow. Mental filter. Focusing only on the negative parts of a situation and ignoring anything good or positive. Example. I met a lot of great people at the party, but one guy didn't talk to me. There must be something wrong with me. Discounting the positives. Believing that positive things that happen to you don't count. Example, my friend complimented me on the meal I made, but she was just being nice. Should statements, telling yourself how you should or must act. An example, I should be able to handle this without getting upset and crying. If you're like me and some of these thinking traps seem awfully familiar, then don't worry, you are not alone. The best way to combat these cognitive distortions is just to become aware of when you're using one. Take a step back and see if you could do or say something different and better. So the first piece of advice that I would give you is to try to separate your thoughts from actual events. Ask yourself the following questions when something upsetting happens. What is the situation? What actually happened? Only include facts that everyone would agree on. Next, what are your thoughts? 
What are you telling yourself? What are your emotions? How do you feel? And then look at your behaviour. What are your behaviours? How are you reacting? What are you doing to cope? The next thing is to challenge the thinking trap. The best way to break a thinking trap is to look at your thoughts like a scientist and consider the hard evidence. Use the facts you've collected to challenge your thinking trap. Here are some ways to do exactly that. So, to examine the evidence. Try to find evidence against the thought. If you make a mistake at work, you might automatically think, I can't do anything right, I must be a terrible employee. When this thought comes up, you might challenge it by asking, is there any evidence to support this thought? Is there any evidence to disprove this thought? You might quickly realise that your boss has complimented your work recently, which doesn't support the idea that you're a bad employee. Ask yourself, would I judge other people if they did the same thing? Am I being harder on myself than I am on other people? This is a great method for challenging thinking traps that involve harsh self-criticism. Find out whether other people you trust agree with your thoughts. For example, you might have trouble with one of your kids and think good parents wouldn't have this kind of problem. To challenge this thought, you can ask other parents if they've ever had any problems with their kids. Test your beliefs in person. For example, if you think that your friends don't care about you, call a few friends and make plans to get together. If you assume that they will all say no, you may be pleasantly surprised to hear that they do want to see you. Try and aim for a balance in your thoughts. Once you have worked through some challenges, try to think of a more balanced thought to replace the old thinking trap. Let's use the following example. I might be in a situation where my friend didn't text me back and I might think, oh no, that's a bit rude of her. You know, she doesn't like me anymore. If I thought like that, my thinking traps would be labelling and also mind reading. The labelling part being that she's so rude and the mind reading part being that she doesn't like me anymore. So I might challenge myself to examine the evidence. Has she ever been rude to me in the past? Does she even have her phone with her, for instance? And then I would come to a more balanced thought. There could be lots of reasons why she didn't text. Maybe she's busy and can't check her phone or maybe her battery has died. I'll wait until the next time we meet before I jump to any negative conclusions about our whole entire friendship. So the question is, are all negative thoughts unhealthy thinking traps? The answer is no. There are times when negative thoughts are realistic. It can still be helpful to find different ways of looking at the situation, however. Try to find a meaningful personal challenge in the situation. See if you can find any opportunities for personal growth or skills development. Many people coping with difficult situations find that their upsetting thoughts improve when they work on other coping skills, such as identifying the main sources of stress in their lives, problem-solving issues that they can control, and finding social support. With practice, this simple technique takes just a few seconds. There are plenty of other wonderful techniques out there to try. So when you're ready, take a dive and see what you can find that works for you. Steph talks about the power of the reticular activating system in the brain and how to focus your mind on the things you wish to achieve. Now, if ever there was someone that has proven this works, it's Steph. (laughs) This centre of the brain is in charge of motivation, behavioural arousal and consciousness. And as Steph rightly points out, will start to find patterns and opportunities that synchronise to that which you are focused on. We know through the wonders of neuroscience that the brain can create new neuropathways for positive cognitive behaviour within as little as 90 days, be that a new habit, lifestyle change, memory or skill foundation. This means that what we think about, our brains literally help us to become – And it will replace neuropathways to old or unused information with new ones. This is called neuroplasticity and also works for negative thought patterning. So if you wish to practice a more positive outlook, 
Using some newly discovered CBT or NLP techniques, mantra, affirmation, etc., you can physically become a more positive person in your neuro wiring within a very short space of time. Now imagine if, like Steph, you created something you can see every day to inspire and motivate you to achieve your goals. By doing something small every day to bring you towards what you see on your vision board, your reticular activating system will seek out ways to help this happen. Your neuropathways will also begin to change as new skills are acquired, and within a short space of time, you may see those significant changes manifesting before your eyes. In case you're wondering, I found a new car within two days and it was exactly what I wanted and I paid a whopping £500 less than it was advertised for. All thanks to my brain helping me to filter Renaults online. Other cars are available, of course. Despite what Steph has gone through, one thing above all else shines through. Her brilliant personality. I think we can all agree that her laughter and positive, hopeful attitude is so heartwarming and possibly one of the reasons she was able to survive such a tragic and horrifying event. Being able to sing her way through major surgery, make light where there was darkness, and in doing so, I'm sure helping her surgeons to get through the amount of work they had to do to save her life, is a gift that we can all learn from. She talks about authentic kindness and empathy, kindness for kindness's sake. And I feel that after this unprecedented year, we have all learned to spread it further and wider than ever before. Something I hope we can continue to do, especially for those that may be struggling now as Steph struggled. For those that are finding it hard to get out of bed or have lost their work or family members through the pandemic or can't even get onto a waiting list to help them with their mental health. We all need to be there for each other right now, to lift each other up and to help each other as much as possible to gather up our lives and keep going, to strive for our dreams and to look after our mental health like never before. For those of you that may be facing a new path, maybe one that you've only just found the bravery inside you to try, remember what Steph's dad said and hold your nerve, kid. Hold your nerve. Finally, I hope that everyone listening today has found something to inspire them in Steph's incredible story. For me, I feel so motivated to remain passionate about my life, Listening to how Steph loves her job reminds me of just how lucky I am to do the things that I love. She also reminds me that strength can be beautiful even in the worst of circumstances, that you can choose to sing instead of scream and love instead of fear. Steph reminds me that I'm far more capable than maybe even I know and that my mind is an exceptional instrument one that has the power to change my entire life if I only take the time to observe it. She also reminds me that our greatest gift above all else is our ability to be kind and empathetic towards others and that we are all inevitably connected in one great human story. As Eckhart Tolle once said, The moment you realise you are not present you are present. Whenever you are able to observe your mind, you are no longer trapped in it. Another factor has come in, something that is not of the mind, the witnessing presence. Realize deeply that the present moment is all you ever have. Next week on the show, we speak to Aisha Arafat about what she lost in a fire and as a consequence, what she gained in her life. Thank you so much for taking the time to listen to the show. If you have a spare moment now, please like, subscribe and tell me your thoughts in a review on Apple Podcasts, which will really help other people like yourself to find the show. Of course, you can also share the show with your friends by following us at The Brave Moment Podcast on Facebook, Instagram and YouTube or on Twitter at Moment Brave or just follow the link tree on all of our social media platforms. 
It's been so wonderful to have you all here with me again. Please get in touch with your own stories and remember, your brave moment starts now.